Hey, what's going on, guys? Dress Venture here. Today, I'm going to be reading William Lilly's History of His Life and Times from the year 1602 to 1681, written by himself in the 66th year to his a- of his age uh, to his worthy friend, Elias Ashmole. So I'm going to read the back of this real quick for anybody who wants to hear that, and I'm going to get into it. Although we cannot with justice compare Elias Ashmole to that excellent antiquary John Leland or William Lilly to the learned and indefatigable Thomas Hearn, yet I think we may fairly rank them with such writers as Honest Anthony Wood, whose diary, diary greatly resembles that of his contemporary and intimate friend Elias Ashmole. The history of Lily's life and times is certainly one of the most entertaining narratives in our language. With respect to the science, he professed of calculating uh, nativities, casting figures in the prediction of events, and other appendages of astrology. He would fain make us think that he was a very seldom and serious believer. Indeed, such is the manner of telling his story. That sometimes the reader may possibly be induced to suppose that Lily rather an enthusiast than an imposter. He relates many in, uh, anecdotes, uh, anecdotes of the pretenders to foretell events, raise spirits, and other impostures with such seeming candor and with such an artless simplicity of style that we are almost persuaded to take his word when he protests such an inviolable respect to truth and sincerity. To conclude, I know no record but this where we find, uh, where we can find so just and so entertaining a history of Doctor D, Doctor Foreman, Booker. Winder, Kelly, Evans, Lily's master, and the famous William Pohl, and Captain Bub Fisk, Sarah Shelbourne, and many others. To these we may add the uncommon effects of the crystal, the appearance of Queen Mab, and other strange and miraculous operations which owe their origin to folly, curiosity, superstition, bigotry, and imposture. So that's what the back of it says. And then... Uh... We're going to get into it. So it says, uh, wrote by himself in the 66th year of his age at Hersham in the parish of Walton Thoms in the country of Surrey, Prapia Manu. It says, I was born in the country of Leicester in an obscure town in the northwest borders thereof called uh, Diceworth, seven miles south of the town of Derby one mile from Castle Donnington, a town of great rudeness, wherein it is not remembered that any of the farmers thereof did ever educate any of their sons to learning. Only my grandfather sent his younger son to Cambridge, whose name was Robert Lilly, and died vicar of uh, Camden in uh, Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire about 1640. The town of Diceworth, did formerly belong long unto the Lord Seagrave, for there is one record in the hands of my cousin Melbourne Williamson, which mentions one acre of land abutting north upon the gates of the Lord Seagrave, and there is one close called Hall Close, wherein the ruins of some ancient buildings appear, and particularly where the Dove House stood, and there is also the ruins of decayed fish ponds and other outages. This town came at length to be the inheritance of Margaret, Countess of Richmond, mother of Henry the Seventh, which Margaret gave this town and lordship of Diceworth unto Christ's College in Cambridge, the master and fellows whereof have ever since and at present enjoy and possess it. In the church of this town, in the church of this town, there is but one uh, monument, and that is a white marble stone. Almost now almost broken to pieces, which was placed there by Robert Lilly, my grandfather, in memory of Jane's wife, the daughter of, Doc, of Mr. Poole of Dolby. In the same con- county, a family now quite extinguished. My m- grandmother's brother was Mr. Henry Poole, one of the Knights of Rhode, or Templars, who, being a soldier at Rhodes at the time, at the taking thereof uh, by... Solomon the Magnificent, in escaping with his life, came afterwards to England, and married the Lady Perrin, or Perham, of Oxfordshire, and was called during his life Sir Henry Poole. 
William Poole, the astrologer, knew him very well and remembers him to have been a very tall person and reputed of great strength in his younger years. The in uh, of this town of Diceworth was formerly the inheritance of three sisters, whereof became votaries. One of the nunnery of Langley in the pasture at the parish of Diceworth valued at the suppression, I mean the whole nunnery, at 32 pounds per annum, and this sister's part is yet enjoyed by the family of the Greys, who now, and for some uh, years past, have the enjoyment and possession of all the lands formerly belonging to the nunnery in the parish of Diceworth, and are at present of the year yearly value of the 350 pounds per annum. One of the sisters gave her part of the great tith, uh, tithes unto a religious house in Bredon upon the hill, and, as the inhabitants report, became a religious person afterwards. The third sister married, and her part of the tithes in succeeding ages became the Earl of Huntingdon, who not many years since sold it to one of his servants. The donation of the vicarage is in the gift of the greys of Langley, unto whom they pay yearly, I mean unto the vic, uh, vicar, or vic, vic, vicar, as I am informed, six pounds per annum. Very lately, some charitable citizens have purchased one-third portion of the tithes and given it for a maintenance of a preaching minister, and it is now of the, valuable, of the value of about 50 pounds per annum. There have been uh, two hermitages in the parish. The last hermit was well remembered by one Thomas Cook, a very ancient inhabitant who in my younger years acquainteth me therewith. This town of Diceworth is divided into three parishes. One part belongs under uh, Lockington, in which part standeth my father's house, over against the west end of the steeple in which I was born. Some uh, other farms are in the parish of Bredon, the rest in the parish of Diceworth. In this town, in this town, but the parish of La, uh, Lockington, was I born the first day of May, 1602. My father's name was William Lilly, son of Robert, the son of Robert, the son of Roland, and my mother was Alice, the daughter of Edward Barham, of Fiskerton, of Fiskerton Mills in Nottinghamshire, two miles from Newark upon Trent. This Edward Barham was born in Norwich and well remembered the rebellion, uh, and well remembered the rebellion of Ket the Tanner in the days of Edward the Sixth. Our family have continued many ages in this town as Yaomen. Many besides the besides the farm, my grandfather, my father, and his ancestors lived in both my father and grandfather uh, had much free land and many houses in the town not belonging to the college as the farm were in they were all born doth and is now at present of the value of 40 pounds for annum and in possession of my brother's son but the free land uh, freehold uh, land and houses formerly purchased by the ancestors were all sold by my grandfather and father, so that now our family depend wholly upon a college lease. Of my infancy, I can speak little, only I do remember that in the fourth year of my age, I had the measles. I was, during my minority, put to learn at such schools and of such masters of the rudeness of the place uh, and country afforded, uh, and country afforded my mother intending I should be a scholar from my infancy, seeing my father's black sightings in the world, and no hopes by plain husbandry to recruit a decayed estate. Therefore, upon Trinity Tuesday, 1613, my father had me to Ashby de la Zouche to be instructed uh, by one Mr. John Brinsley, one in those times of great abilities for instruction of youth in Latin and Greek tongues. He was very severe in his life and conversations and, he, and did breed up many scholars for the university. In religion, he was a strict Puritan, not, conformably, not conformable wholly to the ceremonies of the Church of England. 
in this town of Ashby de la Zouche for many years together, uh, Mr. Arthur Hildersham exercised his ministry at my being there. And all the while I continued at Ashby, he was silenced. This is that famous Hildersham who left behind him a commentary on the 51st Psalm. As almost many sermons upon the 4th of John, both which are printed, he was an excellent uh, textuary of, ex of exemplary life. Exemplary life. All right, guys, I got to take a sip of water real fast. Pleasant in discourse, a strong enemy of the brownest and dissented not from the Church of England in any article of faith, but only about wearing the surplice, baptizing the cross, and kneeling at the sacrament. Most of the people in town were directed by his judgment and so continued, and yet do continue presbyterianly affected. For when the Lord of Lau uh, Lauborough in 1642, 1643, 1644, and 1645 had his garrison in that town, if by chance at any time any troops of, hor of horse had lodged within that town, though they came late at night to their quarters, yet w would one or the other of the town presently give Sir John Gell of Derby notice, so that ere next morning most of his majesty's troops were seized in their lodgings and moved which moved the lord of lowerborough merely to say that there was not a fart left in ashby that but it was presently carried to derby <laughs> uh the several authors i learned i there learned were these uh sententiae pier uh pirilis cato Corderius, uh, Ethsops, Fables, Tolly's Offices, Ovid, De Tristi Bus, lastly Virgil, then Horace, and also Camden's Greek, Greek uh, Grammar, Theognis, and Homer's Iliads. I was only entered unto uh, Udall's he uh, Hebrew Grammar. He never thought logic but often would say it was fit to be learned in universities. In the 14th year of my age, by a strict scholar of Schwarth, black companion, I had liked to have my right eye beaten out as we were at play. The same year about Michael Miss, I got uh, surfeit and thereupon a fever by eating beech nuts. Hmm. Michael Miss. I just learned about that recently. In the 16th year of my age, I was exceedingly troubled in my dreams concerning my salvation and damnation, and also concerning the safety and destruction of the souls of my father and mother. In the nights, I frequently wept, prayed, and mourned, for fear my sins might offend God. In the 17th year of my age, my mother died. In the eighteenth year of my age, Master Brinsley was enforced to keeping school from was enforced from keeping school, being persecuted by the bishop's office. He came to London and then lectured in London, where he afterwards died. In this year, by reason of my father's poverty, I was also enforced to leave school, and so came to my father's house, where I lived in much penury for one year, and taught school one quarter of a year until God's providence provided better for me. For the two last years of my being at school, I was the highest form in the school and the chiefest of that form. I could speak Latin as well as English, could make exemptor, exemptor verses upon any theme, uh, all kinds of verses, hexameter, pentameter, uh, fuel, fulcalax, Imbix, Iambix, <laughs> Sapix, <laughs> and so 
that if any scholar were uh, from remote schools came to dispute, I was ringleader to dispute with them. I would cap verses. If any minister came to examine us, I was brought forth against him, nor would I argue with him unless in the Latin tongue, which I found few of them could speak well without breaking Priscian's head, which if once they did, I would complain to my master, non bene intelligit ligium latium, Nec pro, uh, prorisus locator, which some means something like not good, not very intelligent at speaking Latin, something, something else. In the, der in the derivation of words, I found most of them defective, nor indeed were any of them good grammarians. All and every of those scholars who were of my form and standing, went to Cambridge and proved excellent divines. Only poor I, William Lilly, was not so happy. Fortune then frowning upon father's present condition, he not in any capacity to maintain me at the university. I think that that is a real, real thing, man. You know, nowadays, you know, there's a lot of bright people in, in like public school and whatever, whatever. And then, uh, unfortunately, we don't always have the families to support us to go and, and pursue higher education in a way that's going to allow us to succeed. So while other of our peers go on to these schools and get their degrees and their education, some of us have to choose other paths because of our life. So it was very interesting to hear that. And um, so this is going to be the next chapter. And uh, let's see how long this one is. After a few of these these chapters go a little bit shorter. I'm going to go through a couple more of them, and then I'm going to wrap it up for part one. And uh, I'm at the 25-minute mark. I'll, I'll wrap it up. Of the manner how I came unto London. Worthy sir, I take much delight to recount unto you, even all in every circumstance of my life, whether good, moderate, or evil, Dio Gloria. My father had one Samuel Smatty, for his attorney, unto whom I went sundry uh, a times with letters, who, perceiving I was a scholar, and that I lived miserably in the country, losing my time, nor any ways likely to do better if I continued there pitying my condition, he sent word for me to come and speak with him, and told me that he had lately been at London, where there was a gentleman wanted a youth to attend him and his wife who could write. And I antiquated, or I acquainted with my, I acquainted my father with it, who was very willing to be rid of me, for I could not work, drive the plow, or endure my country, any country labor. My father off would say I was good for nothing. I had only twenty shillings and no more to buy me a new suit, ha hose, duplet, and my duplet was fustian. I repaired to Mister Schmatty when I was a. Uh, accrued for a letter to my master which he gave me upon monday the third or upon april the third monday april the third 1620 i departed from diceworth and came to leicester uh but i must acquaint you that there before i came away i visited my friends amongst who i had given me about 10 shillings which i was which was a great comfort unto me on tuesday april the fourth i took leave of my father then in Leicester, Gow for debt, and came along with Bradshaw, with Bradshaw the carrier, the same person with whom many of the Duke of Buckingham's kindred had come up with. Hark how the wagons crack with their rich ladding. It was a very stormy, weak, cold, and uncomfortable. I footed it all along. We could not reach London until Psalm Sunday. The ninth of April, about half an hour after three in the afternoon, at which time we entered Smithfield. When I had gratified the carrier and his servants, I had seven shillings and six pence left, and no more. One suit of clothes upon my back, two shirts, three bands, one pair of shoes, and as many stockings. Upon the delivery of my letter, my master entertained me, and the next day brought me a new cloak of which you may imagine, good Esquire, whether I was not proud of, because I saw and eat good white bread contrary to our diet in Leicestershire. 
my name, my master's name was Gilbert Wright, born at Market Bosworth in Leicestershire. Uh, my mistress was born at Ashby de la Zeus in the same country, in the same county, and in the town where I had gone to school. Gilbert Wright could neither write nor read. He lived upon his annual rents, was of no calling or profession. He had for many years been servant to the Lady Paulet in Hertfordshire, and when Sergeant Puckering was made Lord Keeper, he made him keeper of his lodgings at Whitehall. When Sir Thomas Egerton was made Lord Chancellor, he entertained him in the same place, and when he married a widow in Newgate Market, the Lord Chancellor recommended him to the company of Salters, London, to admit him into their company. And so they did, and my master in 1624 was master of that company. He was a man of excellent natural parts and would speak publicly upon any occasion very rationally and to the purpose. I write this that the world may know that he was no tailor or myself of that or myself of that of any or, or any other calling or profession. My work was to go before my master to church to attend my master when he went abroad to make clean his shoes, sweep the street, keep help to drive bucks when he washed, fex water from a tub in the thumbs. I have helped to carry 18 tubs of water in one morning, weed, the garden, all manner of drudgeries I willingly performed, scraped trenches. If I had any profession, it was of this nature. I should never have denied being a tailor, for I had been one, uh, for there is no calling so base, uh, which by God's mercy may not afford a livelihood. And had not my master entertained me, I would have been a very, I would have been of a very mean profession heir. I would have returned into the country again, and so here ends the actions of eighteen years of my life. My master married his second wife for her estate. She was competently rich. She married him for considerations he preferably not nocturnal society. Uh, preferred not nocturnal society, so that they lived very uncomfortably. She was about 70 years of age, he 66 or more, um, yet never was any woman more jealous of a husband than she, insomuch whensoever he went into London, she was confident of his going to women. By those means, my life was the more uncomfortable, <laughs> it being very difficult to please two such opposite nature, who, uh, however, as to the things of this world, I had enough and endured their discontents with much severe uh, uh, sereneness. My mistress was very curious to know of such as were then called the cunning or wise men, whether she should bury her husband. Uh, what? My mistress was very curious to know of such as were called cunning or wise men, whether she should bury her husband. She frequently visited such persons, and this occasion begot in me a little desire to learn something that way. But wanting money to buy books, I laid aside these motions and endeavored to please both master and mistress. So this is how William really began to get interested in the wise and the like, spiritual occult, spiritual stuff, is that he saw his mist her his mistress that he worked for go to these people to instruct if he should do she should do certain things to her husband. <laughs> uh, cool. So let me see how long this next next portion is and if I should get started into it. Uh, we got a good little chunk, guys. I'm proud. Um, yeah, we'll do this last chunk, and then we'll wrap it up. It says, of my mistress's death, an occasion thereof, and by uh, an occasion thereof by means of a cancer in her breast. So breast cancer. <clears throat> in 1622, she complained of a pain in her left breast, whereon there appeared a at first a hard knob no bigger than a small pea. It increased in a little time very much it was very hard and sometimes would look very red she took advice of surgeons had oils sear cloths plates of lead and whatnot and in 19 or in 1623 it grew 
very big and spread all around her breast. Then for many weeks, poultices were applied to it, uh, which in continuance of time broke the skin. And then abundance of watery thin stuff came from it, but nothing else. At length of that length, the matter came to uh, superation, but never any great store issued forth. It was exceeding noisome and painful. From the beginning of it, only she died. Uh, from the beginning of it until she died, she would permit no surgeon to dress it, but only myself. I applied everything unto it, and her pains were so great the winter before she died that I had been called out of my bed two or three times in one night to dress and change uh, plasters. In 1624, by degrees with uh, scissors, I cut away all... I cut all... Uh, by degrees and with scissors, I cut all the whole breast away, and I mean the sinus nerves, and in one fortnight or a little more, uh, it appeared as it were mere flesh, all raw, so that she could scarce endure any unguent to be applied. This is crazy, guys. I remember there was a great cleft through the middle of the breast, which when that fully appeared she died that fully appeared she died which was in September 1624 my master being then in the country his kindred in london <clears throat> would uh willingly uh have had mourning for her but by advice of an especial friend of his i con i contra i contradicted them nor would i permit them to look into any chest or trunk in the house. She was decently buried and so fond of me in the time of her sickness, she would never permit me out of her chamber, give me five, gave me five pounds in old gold and sent me unto a private trunk of hers at a friend's house where she had 100 pounds of gold and, and gold. She bid me bring it away and take and take it. But uh, when I opened the trunk, I found nothing therein. For a kinsman of hers had been there a few days before and carried all away. She was in great passion at my relating thereof because she could not gratify my pains in all her sickness. Uh, um, advertised me to help myself when she was gone out of my master's good, which I never did. Courteous Esquire, be not weary of reading thereof or that fo or what followeth. When my mistress died, she had under her armhole a, a small scarlet bag full of many things, which one that was uh, there delivered unto me. There was in this bag several sigils, some of Jupiter and Trine, others of the nature of Venus, some of iron, one of gold, of pure angel gold, of the bigness of a 33 shilling piece of King James coin, in the circumference on one side was engraven uh, visit Leo de Tribu Jude Tetragrammaton. Plus, within the middle, there was engraven a holy lamb. In the other circumference, there was M. Uh, M. Raphael and three pluses. In the middle, and three crosses, or in the middle, Sanctus, Pectris, Alpha, and Omega. The occasion of framing this sigil was thus. Uh, her former husband traveled in Sussex, happened to lodge in an inn and to lie in a chamber thereof, wherein not many months before a country grazer had lain, and in the night cut his own throat. The, after, after that, this night's lodging, he was perpetually and for many years followed by a spirit which vocally in... Uh, articulately provoked him to cut his throat which he was used frequently to say i defy thee i defy thee and to spit at the spirit and the spirit followed him many years he not making any acquaint uh, acquaintance his him he not making any body acquainted with it at last he grew melancholy and discontented which being careful observed by his wife she many times hearing him pronounce i defy thee and she desired to acquaint her with the cause of his distemper uh which he did then away she went to dr simon foreman who lived then in lambsbeth uh lambeth and acquainted him with it having 
who having framed the sickle and hanged it about his neck, he wearing it continually until he died, was never more molested by the spirit. I sold the sickle for 32 shillings, but transcribed the word verbatim as I have related. Sir, you shall now have a story of Simon Foreman as widow as his widow, whom I know well related it to me. But before I relate his death, I shall acquaint you something of the man, as I have gathered them from some manuscripts of his own writings. Alrighty, guys, that's going to wrap it up for part one. Sorry if I trip up a little bit. It's like old English style writing. So I'm like, my, it like trips my brain up a little bit when I'm reading it. But it's like refreshing and it's good for me to get out of my comfort zone like this. Uh, but he sounds like he's had a very interesting life and um, a lot of experiences that I had not expected. So we'll get in more to Dr. Simon Foreman in the next part. Um, thank you for watching and uh, I hope that you will tune in for part two. Peace.